Good morning, New Life Church. Whoever invents windshield wipers for glasses is going to become a very wealthy person. Just telling you, I would buy one of those. Uh, so glad you're here this morning. And for those of you that are joining us online right now, we're so glad you've joined us in that way. It's just good to be together. It's good to worship together. And um, I don't know about you, but I need to be reminded these days all the time that God is sovereign. Do you need to be reminded of that? Like that God is still in control. None of God's plans for us, for as, as families, as individuals, as a church, have been undone by all that's happening around us. God is sovereign. God is in control. And so I just pray that we would all really be encouraged by that reality here this morning. Now, if you're visiting us for the very first time, we're so glad that you're here. What an interesting time to visit church for the first time. Not everything here is normal uh, but we still hope that you, uh, you just are encouraged by your experience this morning. For those of you that are joining us online, uh, maybe for the first time, we're glad that you're doing it in that way. If online, if you would just on our Facebook page uh, send us a message with the word connect, we'd love to uh, uh, connect with you and give you a gift to thank you for joining us online. Same for those of you in the room. If this is your first time after the service, encourage you to head over to our Welcome Center. We'd love to put a gift in your hands to thank you for being here, answer whatever questions you might have about who we are, what we do. Well, uh, tomorrow is Code Red. Have you heard? 1201 Monday, Code Red. Things change a little bit. What changes for New Life Church? Well, a few things. Next Sunday, uh, and then each Sunday going forward, uh, our, our capacity here Sunday morning is reduced to half of what it is now. There will not be as many people in the room uh, next Sundays are right now, which is too bad. Uh, our limit will be 63 people per service. We're still going to have the 9 o'clock, 1045 service. It just means that uh, our, our numbers are reduced. The maximum attendance can be 63. So uh, if you feel comfortable to continue to come, that's awesome. Just continue to go online and register. For those of you who, uh, who can't make it for whatever reason, we just encourage you to take advantage of our online service. This is the third Sunday in a row now that we've had that live online service at 9 o'clock. And so um, it's a great way. If you can't be here to join us and worship together and hear God's word preached uh, that way. So on our Facebook page, 9 o'clock is our live service. And then uh, after the service is over, the recording of that can be found there uh, on our Facebook page as well. What about the midweek stuff? You know, Tuesday grow nights with the adult classes and with our Kids Connect and our teen Bible studies, Wednesday evenings. Well, that stuff, for the time being, will continue. We might have to shift it a little bit. Uh, may maybe some groups will have to move to a bit of a bigger room to accommodate uh, the group. But uh, we're going to continue to do that this Tuesday, and we're just going to take it a week at a time. So that's happening. Now, one thing I do want to share with you, which I'm really excited about, so particularly for you parents, your families here and at home, uh, this is for you. We don't have Sunday school here for kids Sunday mornings right now. Uh, kids Connect, we know that not all the families can bring their kids out to Kids Connect. Some of you maybe aren't going to feel comfortable now in Code Red to do that. For a time, for a while now, we've been wanting to provide an at-home resource for you families so that you could do Sunday school at home. So that as families, you could have spiritual conversation and grow together as families. And so this is just a timely thing, part of God's grace for our church, but the plan had already been that that was going to be launched this Tuesday. And so beginning this Tuesday and every Tuesday after that, uh, families... You're going to get an email with a link from Angela, our children's ministry director, a link to a video on our new New Life uh, Church Kids YouTube channel. It's going to have an engaging video uh, with, with a Bible lesson for kids. There's going to be a preschool version. There's going to be an elementary kids uh, version. We want to be able to tailor that for kids of every age. You're going to find an engaging uh, Bible story there with some discussion questions as a family. There's an app that we want you parents to download uh, called Lifeway Kids, which goes with our curriculum and provides uh, coloring pages and activities and games and music that goes with each lesson. It's like $2, $2. And uh, then you have access to all of this for your kids. My kids have been using it. Pippa's been on there, been loving it. And so um, you, hopefully family's got an email about that this week. If not, reach out to Angela, call our office. And we'd love to make sure that each of you families has that resource and that you as parents are equipped, and maybe as grandparents as well, equipped uh, to, lead, to lead your kids 
in, uh, in, their, in growth, their relationship with Jesus. Uh, and just, so just stay tuned how this is going to affect uh, us going forward. Our, our New Life Hockey, last night was the last time. Anyone had New Life Hockey last night? Um, so the, the rinks are closed, obviously, for the time being. So New Life Hockey is on pause for a little while. But just stay tuned for more information, church. Uh, hopefully this last week, many of you would have gotten a congregational survey we sent out. You might remember a year ago, this, uh, this room was full of, of you coming together, having a conversation about the future of our church. And uh, we can't do it in that way this year, but we've sent out a survey to, to you, and we would love for you to take 15 minutes, you have, if you haven't already, to complete a few questions on this survey, because we want your input. As staff and as leaders, we want you to be a part of the process moving forward of, of establishing some, some direction, ministry goals for 2021 and beyond to help shape that ministry and, and to help us know how we can engage you in mu meaningful ways to participate in that ministry. So if you didn't get that email with that survey, call the office, we'll get it to you. If you'd rather have a paper copy, you can get that paper copy at our Welcome Center this morning, and I just ask that you have that into us by Thursday of this week. Would really appreciate that. Here in a moment, uh, I'm just going to lead us in prayer before Pastor Darren comes up to preach, open God's word with us this morning. Uh, and this would be normally the time when we would pass offering plates and take up our offering. And if you've already been here a few times, you know that we're not doing it that way right now. We've got those offering buckets out in the foyer there, those yellow buckets. We got our interact machine you can use there as well. But for those of you that are at home watching, uh, there's a few really easy ways if you want to contribute through financial giving to our ministry. Uh, you can go to our, our website, newlifesonal.com, hit the Give tab, and it'll guide you through that process. It really just takes a minute. Or something even easier to that, you should see this number on the screen. If you would just text uh, a dollar amount, if you wanted to give 100 bucks, you would just type 100 to this number, 84321, and you'll get a confirmation email, so you'll be comfortable. It's going to the right place, and it's really super simple. And so for those of you who are, who are at home, that's one way that you can uh, worship in giving with us here this morning as well. Uh, and so before we continue and come to God's word together, we just want to invite him to speak to us. This is what I believe, church. God wants to speak to you this morning. He wants to speak to us as a church, but God is alive. The God who spoke the words that we're going to read still speaks those words today to us. And so God wants to speak to you. And so let's just pray that God uh, would speak, and as he does, that we would open up our hearts and our minds to receive his good word for us. So just join me in prayer. Father God, we love you for who you are. We know you and we know you because you have made yourself known. You have real, re revealed to us the type of God you are, that you are a God who created the universe into existence just by your, your will, your word. And today you are infinitely powerful over all other powers and you are sovereign over the world, and you are sovereign over COVID, and you are sovereign over every situation we're facing today. And so we thank you, God, that, that you are infinite in your power, but also in your love. As small as we are, you care for each and every one of us. You care for our needs, our struggles, and, and you want to provide everything that's needed for us to do your will. And so, God, we just find peace in that reality that you are with us and you are leading us through this difficult time as a church and as families. Um, apparently there's an election in two days, God, south of the border. And uh, we know that that is a very consequential decision for the world. And I know a lot of people are anxious about what's going to happen on Tuesday. A lot of people have really strong feelings. But God, again, we know you're sovereign over that. And I just pray that you would help us, Christians here and in the States and everywhere, Lord, fix our focus on you. Lord, ultimately, hope is not found in politics. Hope is not found in government programs, political parties, any other ideas. Hope is found in you. May we fix our eyes on, on you as our only hope, and may we help other people the way we use Facebook and social media during this time, the way we have conversations with others about all these hardships. May, instead of just being uh, grumblers and airing grievances, may we point people to you as our only hope. 
and the satisfier, the meter of all of our needs. God, we just pray for your protection over our church and our communities and over Manitoba and ultimately the world against COVID, Lord. It's making so many sick and some are even dying. And uh, we have many people in our church who are working on the front lines and hospitals and care homes with these people. And we pray your protection over our people that are on the front lines, God. And, and over each one of us, Lord, that you would keep this virus away from us, God. And that you would just ultimately, that you would snuff this out. We know that you have the power, God, to protect us from this. And so uh, forgive us if, if we are too slow to come to you to lay that request before you. Uh, but we put our trust in you and just ask for your protection, God. And now as we come to your word, we come believing that these are living words. These are not just old historical words. The letter we're going to look at, the letter to the church in Smyrna, is not just a historical artifact for us to unpack. It is your word for us today. In 2020 in Stonewall, Manitoba. And so God, I believe that you want to speak to us as a church. You want to shape us to be more than the people that you want us to be, you've called us to be, and you want to shape each and every person in this room and those listening online. And So God, um, we invite you to speak to us through your word, by your spirit, and we just offer you ourselves. We open up our hearts. We open up your minds to you and your word and just say to you, God, have your, your will uh, be done in us. Have your way in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, and together we say, amen. Darren, why don't you come on up? Good morning, everybody. So good to be with you this morning. I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles, uh, if you've brought them along, to uh, Revelation chapter 2 where we're going to be reading from uh, verses 8 to 11. Uh, this week is uh, Jesus' second letter. Last week was the first letter. Rusty took us through Jesus' letter to Ephesus uh, in this, this uh, eight-week series on these seven letters called Dear Church. And uh, today we go through uh, Jesus' letter to Smyrna. So reading now from uh, Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. These are the words of Jesus. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Those are Jesus' words to the church in the city of Smyrna. It was a city known as the glory of Ionia, first of Asia in beauty and size, proclaimed the stamps on its coins. It was thought of as the birthplace of Homer, was refounded by Alexander the Great himself. It was renowned throughout the ancient world for its devotion to science, to medicine, and to rhetoric. Smyrna was thought of as the Asian jewel of the Roman Empire. And Smyrna was jealous of her status in that empire. Loyalty to Rome was a source of fierce pride to the Smyrnans. After all, when Rome was entangled in a war against a rival empire, who came to her aid? 
none other than Smyrna. And who created a religion for Rome by erecting a temple in honor of Dea Roma, whose worship has spread throughout the empire? None other than Smyrna. And so it was that none other than Smyrna was named as the temple keeper of the imperial cult by the emperor Tiberius himself. Now, what would it have been like to live in the time of Smyrna as a Christian, as one of the Christianoi who came together week by week in the shelter of their homes to worship? Because it was not the emperor that they worshiped as Lord, as so many of the Roman citizens did. It was a crucified Galilean. And yet they lived in the very den of the imperial cult. And in the den of the imperial cult, if you did not join in the worship of the imperial cult, the activities of the imperial cult, you did not belong because you were distancing yourself from the one thing that everyone in this city, Smyrna, had in common, which was loyalty to Rome, the worship of Rome, the goddess of Rome, Dea Roma. And if you did not share that with your fellow citizens, if you cut yourself off from the one thing that everyone had in common in this city, what hope would you have for getting along, for earning a living, for raising a family in Smyrna? How would the other children in this city, how would the other women how would the men of Smyrna treat your dear family when they heard that you were a traitor? You see, in the past, the Christians had been tolerated as a new breed of Jew. In fact, most Christians had been born as Jews. And even for those who weren't, even for those who weren't ethnic Jews, well, they worshiped the same God as the Jews, they studied the same scriptures as the Jews, and they lived by the same moral code as the Jews. Even their crucified Galilean, Jesus, was a Jew. And so for a time, the Romans were content to just treat Christians as some other kind of Jew, which was a good thing. It was a good thing for them because the Jews were an exception, the only exception among the peoples of the Roman Empire. They had this special arrangement. Rather than having to join in the imperial cult, in the imperial worship, by making sacrifices to the emperor, to the goddess of Rome, Jews could still sacrifice to their own God. So long as they made sacrifices on behalf of the emperor as well. And so the Jews were safe. They were safe. They could worship their own God in their own way without fear. And as long as the Roman authorities saw Christians as a kind of Jew, well then Christians too would be safe. But then things started changing. Certain Jews begin, began to tell the Roman authorities that actually Christians were not a kind of Jew. They were different. They began to tell the Roman authorities that, you know what, Christians don't make sacrifices on behalf of the emperor because actually Christians don't make sacrifices because Christians aren't Jews. And suddenly, these people called the Christianoi, the Christians, they began to feel very alone. 
They began to feel very isolated. They began to feel very vulnerable in this place, in this city. Suddenly they began to find themselves lying awake in the dark of night, shrinking at the sounds outside their doors, worrying that, that someone might have said something about them in particular, right? Anxious that, that somebody, somebody might be coming to their door that night that those, those sounds, the heavy sound of footfall outside coming nearer and nearer would stop at their house that night. And that's what it was like to live in this time as a Christian in Smyrna. So you think about that. You think about these Christians gathering together in small homes in the midst of the city and imagine how they would have felt when a secret messenger, a courier from Ephesus, 45 miles south, arrives and produces a letter written by one of Jesus' original disciples and addressed directly to them, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Death. You know, there's a reason that, uh, that the Christian life begins with the metaphor of death, of dying, of being buried with Christ. That's how Paul puts it. And the reason is that that is where new life actually begins. New life in Christ, it it begins with this decision to give up this life, right? To give up this life and all that it offers to Jesus. And if you do not do that, if you don't do that, if you will not give up your supposed rights to this life, well then by definition you cannot live as a Christian, because that life that you could have with Jesus, with Christ, it has its beginning, it has its birth with a decision to give up this life. And the thing about that is that it isn't just a one-time decision. It isn't just some decision that you make as a kid and then forget about, right? Or you think that's, that's all that it took. It's an everyday decision. And if you don't make that decision every day, each day, then you're going to be shaken. You're going to be intimidated by anything that threatens your life in this world. You're going to be shaken by the powers of this world. You're going to be terrified of disease. You're going to be scared of the government, what it could do to you what it could take from you. You're going to take on whatever issues and causes, opinions, that the world around you tells you to take on. And in so doing, you're going to lose your real life. And so this letter, this letter from Jesus to Smyrna, this letter is a warning to be careful. Christians. Be careful, Christians. Be careful to remember 
always that your first allegiance is to Christ. It isn't to some empire. It isn't to some nation. It is to Jesus. In a time when our world, our government, is telling us that killing babies is permissible, that our sexuality is malleable, that in fact any and all of our moral convictions are to be submitted to the changing whims of a voting majority, we've got to remember that our first allegiance is to Jesus. You know, I'll never forget something that a lady once told me. She was my driving instructor. who's was in high school. I remember we were driving along in the training car one day. And I was asking her questions about, you know, what should a driver do in this situation or in, in that situation? I was getting really detailed with her. And she kind of wanted to give me a larger principle that uh, would sort of answer multiple questions at once. And uh, I don't even think she knew how profound uh, was the thing that she said to me. You know what she said? She said, Darren, one thing you need to remember whenever you're driving is that what's legal isn't always safe. And what's safe isn't always legal. And we sh when she said that, it just hit me like lightning. What's legal isn't always safe. And what's safe isn't always legal. And that is a spiritual principle if ever there was one. You know, sometimes we get confused as Christians. We begin to think that, well, well since God loves us, and he does, since God loves us, he must be all about our immediate safety and our immediate comfort. But he isn't. He isn't all about those things. God is about our goodness. He is about our eternal safety and our eternal comfort. And so Jesus tells these Christians in Smyrna, you're about to lose your immediate safety. You're about to lose your immediate comfort. The devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. You know, we look at everything that's happening in our world right now, with pandemic, with mandates. We never know how long one mandate's going to last. We, we don't know how long the, this current pandemic and everything surrounding it is going to last. But God knows. God is sovereign over these things. There are evils in this world, but none of them None of them are out of the sovereignty of God. It's not as though the devil and God are like two sides, right, of the same coin or that they're two equally opposing forces like in Star Wars where you have the good side of the force and the dark side of the force. God is sovereign over everything. And yet, in his goodness, as he watches over us, he allows us to be tested for our good. And he knows how long each and every one of these tests is going to last. And he tells us, be faithful. Be faithful, even to the point of death. He wants us to remember that what is good, what is right, isn't always legal. And what is legal isn't always good, isn't always right. For Christians who live in a world, right? In an empire that is not about the worship of God. Be faithful, Jesus reminds us. Just like Peter was faithful, just like John and James were faithful, his disciples to the death, so, like, so much like all the Christians right? Between them and us. These models of truth, these models telling us that what is safe, what is good, isn't always what the empire around you tells you you should believe. And so we need these models of goodness in our lives in the midst of adversity. 
And just to give you another model of that very thing, we're going to take a visit in history to the city of Rome around the year 200. The rain is coming down in sheets. It's hitting the pavement stones almost as loud as the slap of the feet of a young man named Alexamenos as he runs, gasping for breath, toward the imperial pedagogium, the school for the emperor's page boys. The clouds are gray as the new day begins, and he knows he mustn't be late lest he risk being questioned on what he's been doing. Because each morning he wakes up in the darkness, and Alexamenos, he slips out of his bunk. He quietly walks out of the barracks. He's careful not to disturb any of the rest of the emperor's page boys. And not just for their sake, not just to not disturb their sleep, though heaven knows they all need it, but for his sake, indeed for his safety. After all, what might become of him if, if someone were to discover his unusual habits? If someone were to learn that one of the emperor's own slaves had joined the cult of the Christians, a cult which the emperor himself has officially forbidden. But it's okay, he's on time. For even as Alexamenos runs in beneath the shelter of his school, of the Pedagogium's overhang, he sees the other boys still there. They're not yet inside. But what are they doing? huddled there and snickering around that, that space by the wall. What is it they're laughing at? Something being scratched into the plaster by one of the older boys. Alexamenos steps in for a closer look. And just as he does, the bugle sounds for the morning formation. And the boys, they break away to find their way into the school, leaving young Alexamenos standing alone, dripping with rain in front of this drawing. What is it of? He looks at it. It's, it's a picture of a boy standing with his arm upraised in a posture of worship before a man who's been crucified. The hands of the man and the legs of the man, they're pinned to a cross. Only, what is that? It doesn't seem to have the head of a man. Instead, in the drawing, he's been given the head of an ass. And as the young page stands there, staring, he feels the blood rush into his face because scrawled beneath this drawing in crude, misspelled letters lies the caption, Alexamenos worships his God. You know, the ancient Roman Empire, it prided itself as a regime of tolerance. And what that meant was that whenever Rome conquered a new group of people, it didn't demand that they give up their religion. No, they could go right on worshiping whatever gods they served. And not only that, but Rome would welcome those gods. It would include them within its system. Just bring them into the great Roman pantheon there was only one catch. In return for inclusion, that new group of people had to bring something into their system, which would express their newfound loyalty to the empire of Rome. They had to bring in the genius Augusti, the spirit of Rome, that were genius, it referred to the spirit of Rome, the spirit of the emperor, the guardian force that made the empire all that it was. 
And any refusal to honor this genius, this guardian spirit of the empire of Rome, any refusal to bow or sprinkle incense before it would be seen as treason, disloyalty to Rome. And then along come these Christians. And not only do they refuse to honor the gods of the Roman pantheon, they refuse to honor the genius, the spirit of Rome. And so Christians were called atheists, those who were against the gods. And they were seen as dangerous to the fabric, to the very essence of Rome. And they weren't just dangerous. They were ridiculous. Their message proclaimed a crucified criminal. And what could possibly be more idiotic than that to the Roman mind? I mean, if you wanted to make up a religion in the context of ancient Rome, the very last thing that you would do is create a religion with a cross at its center. And so we come upon that crude sketch of the crucified ass and our young page boy standing before him. Alexamenos, worshiping his God. This is the way Christians were thought of. They were made fun of. They were blackballed and punished as traitors. And if you had any thought of making a name in this world, the very last thing you would do is become this God's disciple. You know, I think about all of that. This is history. I think about all of that, and I wonder what this young man, this Alexamenos, went through. Because that story, that entire story, although the details are mine, it's rooted in history. It's rooted in history. This drawing was discovered in a paedagogium, a training school for page boys. It was found scratched into the plaster of a wall near the Palatine Hill in Rome. Scholars have dated it to around the year 200 during the reign of Emperor Septimus Severus when followers of Jesus were viciously persecuted. And ironically, you know what? This drawing, it may very well be our oldest surviving depiction of Jesus. It's come to be known as the Alexamenos Graffito. And so what did he go through? What did he go through, this young Alexamenos? You know, and, and how did he come to be, to be a Christian in the first place? You know, I think about the, the church in this age, and I wonder, how did it spread with everything that was against them? How did these Christians keep spreading the news about Jesus, the gospel? The people of ancient Rome, who sacrificed to the gods, to the genius of the emperor, so many of them, they didn't really believe in any of it not in a way that actually made a difference to their lives. And then along come these Christians, like our friend Alexamenos, who are willing to give up everything, their safety, their property, even their lives, just to stay true to this crucified Jesus. You know how the Romans saw that? The Romans saw that as a kind of perversity. They wrote about it in their letters. This is what the Roman governor Pliny wrote about these Christians, so stubborn. He said, whatever the nature of their creed, stubbornness and obstinacy surely deserve to be punished. Just the simple fact that they won't bow, right? That they won't bend their morals, their beliefs, to the good of the Roman Empire. Just that alone deserves to be punished. I wonder how Alexamenos felt stationed by Christ in this imperial darkness, trying to be faithful in that place.
I wonder what it was like for him to get up for those early morning prayers. I imagine him whispering to God in the darkness, just whispering, though I lose everything, though I am left all alone, my Lord Jesus, I will give this life for you. I will give this life for you. I thought about that this week. I thought about all those lonely moments that, uh, that Christians in this city must have faced. And I remembered what Rusty shared last week. I wasn't here last week. I was at a retreat speaking. But I listened to the sermon this week. And I heard about how as a youth he would go home at lunchtime and listen to that song, A Few Good Men. And he'd find new resolve to live in this world for Christ. Made me think of all the times in my youth, even in my adult years, when I've been laughed at, when I've been made fun of as a Christian, called Jesus boy, things like that. You know, sometimes we can feel very alone in this world, and nobody likes feeling alone. It exerts a huge pressure to just fit in just toe the line, say, think, do what everyone else around you is saying, thinking, and doing. Sometimes we can feel very alone, like our friend Alexaminos. But we're never alone, are we? We're never alone. We have models like Alexaminos. We're part of this great chain Two weeks ago, Rusty gave us these chains. I made it my keychain. Every time I take out my keys, I remember. I remember that Jesus is the first link, and then the apostles, and then Christians like Alexaminos, telling each other the good news about him, experiencing new life in Christ up until my day when I heard the gospel, and who's the next link, right? Who am I going to share that with? Who are you going to share that with? The message about Jesus. We're part of this great chain. We're never alone. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, Scripture tells us. And what's more, like Alexaminos, we have the helper. The spirit of Christ. Not the genius of the emperor, the spirit of this age. We have the spirit of Jesus. The living Holy Spirit empowering us to live the way that he has called us to live, helping us in our lives for Christ. As I bring this to a conclusion, though, it it appears that uh, that Alexaminos actually had one more person. He He had a person that I suspect was also inhabited by that same Holy Spirit, Because very close to the spot, this very spot where this first drawing was discovered, it was in a nearby chamber actually, archaeologists discovered another inscription. And it was written by a different hand. They discovered another inscription, and you know what it said? It said, Alexaminos Fidelis which means Alexaminos is faithful. He had someone else watching him who saw his life and testified, Alexaminos is faithful, which is all that Christ calls us to. Be faithful, even to the point of death. Let's bow our heads as the musicians come forward. Lord God, we hear the calling of your word to be faithful even to the point of death. And we know, we know that what is legal is not always safe or good. And what is good, what is faithful is not always legal. We know, Lord, that uh, our immediate comfort, our immediate safety are not what is most important. 
but faithfulness, goodness, eternal comfort and safety in knowing you, in giving our lives to your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we pray, empower us by your Holy Spirit. Give us your perspective each day. Let us not lose our footing. We make this decision afresh today to give our life for you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.